For anyone who is big into strategic gaming like myself, you know that Paradox Interactive is a giant in the field. When they offered to sponsor my video, I was more than happy. But when they told me what their latest development was, I was ecstatic. May 31st, a few days from now, is the launch date of the newest DLC to the Crusader Kings 3 lineup. It's called The Fate of Iberia. It has to do with something called the Reconquista. You might have heard of it, or as I'd like to call it, my obsession in history for the past couple of years. Folks, they went all out on this one. The artwork is beautiful, the gameplay is excellent, and most importantly, they captured the essence of the time period. The Reconquista was a 781-year process that most history books either simply ignore or gloss over. This game brings it to life. You can play as either the Christian rulers and perhaps seek to complete the conquest of the Iberian Peninsula centuries ahead of time, or as the Muslim sovereigns and hold up against the onslaught, keeping a hold on Iberia well into the Age of Discovery. Do you have it in you to become a great conqueror like Ferdinand III, Abdelrahman I, or Isabella of Castile? Perhaps you seek to advance your nation with the pursuit of knowledge like Alfonso X, the wise king, or Muhammad V, who made the Alhambra what it was. Here you can find out. If you hit the link below in the description of the video, you'll be doing my channel a huge favor and you'll be bringing this amazing time to life. So hit that link and immerse yourself into the Reconquista. And now it's time to begin our own journey into the fate of Iberia. The Iberian Peninsula, once the province of Hispania, was the land of the Reconquista. The sovereigns of the Islamic and Christian states had struggled for control. Sometimes there were friends and allies, and at other times they were devoted enemies. But after seven centuries, the Christian kingdoms of Castile, Aragon, Navarre, and Portugal held dominance. The tide had turned definitively against the Muslims who had once held supremacy over the land. Now only Granada, the realm of the Nazareth, remained as the last kingdom of Islam. It was completely isolated with few allies and by the 15th century was in decline. But that said, against all the odds, it had managed to endure. Even Castile, the largest of the Christian kingdoms, was unable to complete the Reconquista and now itself faced one of its darkest times. In the early part of December 1474, the King of Castile, Henry IV, had died. Despite occupying the throne of a large realm, he was not a man that was remembered for great exploits. Indeed, behind his back, he gained the unfortunate title, El Impotente. The name referred not just to his failure in ruling his kingdom, governing his economy, and leading his men in battle. It also applied to his marital exploits, or lack thereof. It was rumored in his great court that the child his young wife had given birth to was not his at all. Henry, or Enrique, was a reflection of the poor state of affairs that Castile had descended into in the latter part of the 15th century. The kingdom was a far cry from its glory days where the great kings of Castile held the initiative. It was, after all, under Ferdinand III that Cordoba and Seville were conquered in the mid-13th century. 
thus depriving the Iberian Muslims of their spiritual and political capitals, respectively. Then, in the 14th century, Alfonso XI, known as the Avenger, had demolished a massive Marinid force, driving the North African power back into the Maghreb. Alfonso would then come within a hair's breadth at completing the Reconquista, only to be wiped out, along with his immense army, at the gates of Gibraltar by the Black Death. Then came the time of great civil war under Peter the Cruel, which culminated in the rise of the House of Trastamara, which managed to bring some degree of stability. But those days were in the past. Castile was now on the brink of anarchy and collapse. The economy was in tatters, the aristocracy was ready to revolt, and its lands were prepared to secede. It would not have taken much to push the delicate state of affairs into another destructive civil war. But great change was coming, and it was now time for a new sovereign to take the stage. Her name was Isabella. She was a princess of Castile who possessed a resolve that surpassed many of the kings of her lineage. She was the younger half-sister of Henry IV, but was an unlikely candidate to rule on the basis of her birthright and gender. Indeed, no woman had held power over the combined lands of Castile and Leon in 200 years. But now, as her older brother, Henry IV, the king, was dead, his only heir being a young girl. And furthermore, her younger brother, Alfonso, the Prince of Asturias, who was next in line, had died six years prior. She now had a great opportunity before her. At this point in history, she was already married. Her husband, Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of neighboring Aragon, was traveling when word of the king's death became public. He was thus in no position to interfere. On that cold, bright day, December 13th, 1474, this articulate and beautiful, some would argue viciously ambitious, 23-year-old red-haired princess decided that she was going to end the argument of who would rule Castile next. Isabella had taken it upon herself that she and she alone would wear the crown. And make no mistake, this was a coup. The coronation was held in Segovia. It was designed to be an elegant but formidable affair. Isabella had carefully planned it so, with the intent to both shock and awe those witnessing her ascendancy. On that day, she wore not the gown of a princess, but rather that of a queen. It was richly endowed with jewels which broadcasted her authority. She rode upon a magnificent steed, and her entourage followed her devotedly. Before her walked a court official who held above his head an unsheathed sword. Its tip was pointing to the sky. The symbolism was both ancient and clear. Isabella not only wanted to have power, but she was not going to be afraid to use it either. As the day wore on, the procession made its way into the Cathedral of Segovia, where she came before the altar. Just minutes before, she had a silver crown placed on her head. There, in front of everyone to see, she prostrated herself on the floor in prayer asking her divinity for strength in the enormous trials that laid ahead of her. Her tasks were nearly insurmountable, but she had vision. Isabella's mind looked beyond Iberia. It looked at not just the kingdom she would have to keep together and the aristocracy that she would have to keep in line. Her thoughts transcended her flailing allies, who would be waiting for weakness in her rule for exploitation. Isabella's mind transcended to the level of perceiving the fate of Christianity, which she felt was greatly imperiled. And perhaps she had a really good reason to feel this way. Far to the east, on the other end of the Mediterranean Sea, 
the power of the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II was on the rise. It was only a mere two decades before that he had conquered Constantinople, the city of the world's desire, which also happened to be the most formidable stronghold in Christendom. In taking the great city, Mehmed had sealed the fate of the Romans. In doing so, he had brought down a Christian empire that had lasted for over a thousand years. Constantinople was now his capital, and from there, his vast armies had marched forth, expanding his Islamic domain into the west. His drive knew no bounds, and his dreams for a conquest had just started. The popes of Europe tried in vain to rally a champion to stem the tide, with little result. There were now new fears that if the Ottomans allied themselves with the Nazareth of Granada, they would have a beachhead to begin a new front for an invasion of the Iberian Peninsula. And if that were to prove successful, the remaining kingdoms of Europe would perhaps be fighting a two-front war. It was into this world that Isabella was thrown, an impoverished kingdom teetering on the brink of civil war, surrounded by enemies. But as she stood in the waning sun on that cold winter's day, her determination was as strong as ever. Like her idol, Joan of Arc, who had died 40 years prior, the new Castilian queen saw herself as a defender of the faith, infused by her god with a calling that could not be questioned. Despite her dangerous world and her precarious position in it, she walked with a sense of destiny. Queen Isabella knew then and there that she was going to use whatever means necessary, which included utter brutality, if it was needed to accomplish what she felt was expected of her. She would need this mindset and this determination. The great ordeal which now laid before her would require her full measure of devotion. <laughs>